Uh, good evening, everyone. If we could uh, get settled. Well, good evening, everyone. As many of you know, I'm Clark Irvin. I'm the chairman of the Aspen Institute's Homeland Security Program and the founder and organizer of the annual Aspen Security Forum. We are delighted to welcome all of you to Aspen this week for this summer's forum. And I must say that it promises to be our most exciting forum ever. I'd like to begin by thanking our principal sponsors, IASTI, Deloitte, Lockheed Martin, Symantec, and Target, and our media partner this year, NBC News and MSNBC. And we are grateful for additional support from AUSA, Capgemini, and MITRE Corporation. Tonight's uh, session is part of the McCloskey Speaker Series, and so our thanks to Tom and Bonnie McCloskey for their support of the series and this evening's program. When we gathered in Aspen last summer at the end of the Obama administration, the world seemed like a particularly dangerous and complicated place. In the transition sense to the new Trump administration, what seemed impossible is reality. The world is even more complicated and dangerous. If there was any doubt about the danger that Putin's Russia poses to the United States, our NATO allies, and the entire post-World War II international order, that doubt has been erased. Though the president has developed a warm relationship with President Xi, China continues to assert its primacy over the South China Sea. North Korea has launched an ICBM, posing a direct threat to the United States. And though the so-called caliphate in Iraq and uh, Syria is shrinking, ISIS continues its global reign of terror. So as this week's speakers survey the global geopolitical landscape, there is no end of challenges for them to explore and no end of questions for them to attempt to answer. So a warm welcome again to all of you. And with that, please welcome Hugh Thompson of Symantec, who will kick off tonight's program. Thank you very much. Clark, thanks. Thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be with you uh, here at this forum. And Symantec is absolutely delighted to be a part of this event this year. Uh, Clark, we've admired this event for many years at a distance, so, so thrilled to be, uh, be here and a part of it. Uh, I want to introduce our two speakers this afternoon. Secretary John Kelly is the nation's fifth Secretary of Homeland Security. The job is only about 14 years old, uh, but in that short time, the threat landscape, as Clark mentioned, has changed dramatically, and it continues to evolve daily. Cybersecurity is now a critical concern. Aggressive destabilizing action is happening and occurring by other nations against the U.S. and dominates national conversation. Compared to the post-9-11 era, when the Secretary's job was created, things are even more complex today, and they promise to be even more complex than that tomorrow. Secretary Kelly enlisted in the Marines in 1970 and rose to lead the U.S. Southern Command and command the multinational force west in Iraq before President Trump named him to lead DHS. He assumed the job six months ago, and what uh, an incredible six months it's been. Our moderator is Pete Williams, justice correspondent at NBC News. Pete has been at NBC since 1993. Before that, he was already a familiar face as Pentagon spokesman. And he got his start in broadcast news, not from where we sit, uh, but here at KTWO in Casper, Wyoming, in his hometown. A shout out to Casper uh, for all of those tuning in. So please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming Pete Williams and our special guest, John Kelly, United States Secretary of Homeland Security. I thought for a moment this was going to be simultaneously translated into Kali. <laughs> there was a dog barking, those people on this side of the room, that's what I... <laughs> well, you heard Mr. Secretary, you heard Clark Irvin say this was going to be an exciting event, so please try to be exciting. Uh, 
Let me just start by asking, what's a nice guy like you doing in a place like this? How did you happen to become, and why did you decide to become Secretary of Homeland Security? Uh, well, Pete, and again, a real privilege to be here, and thanks for the invitation, Hugh, and others that had uh, influenced my appearance tonight. Uh, I don't know why I'm sitting here. I don't know how I got here. Um, I literally... That's reassuring. Yeah. <laughs> I literally did not know Mr. Trump at all, and I didn't know anyone that knew Mr. Trump. I was uh, about 10 days after the election. Uh, I was watching college football with my wife on a Saturday afternoon. I got a, a cold call, Reince Priebus, uh, and I barely remembered that name. And once he convinced me, it really was Reince Priebus and not one of my retired friends who does this kind of thing. Uh, you know, said Mr. Trump would like to uh, have an opportunity to talk to you maybe about going into the administration. Hung up. My wife uh, said, what was that all about? And I had just, bit, I was retired almost exactly eight months from 45 and a half years in the Marine Corps and, uh, you know, 29 moves. And I could go in and, oh, John, how are you doing? Uh, now I have to tell the truth. I see John's here. Um, but anyways, uh, I said, well, it's Ryan's Priebus and, and uh, they may offer me a job. What do you think? And, and she said, um, well, you know, if we're nothing, uh, the Kelly family is a family of service to the nation, two, two sons who are Marines, daughter in, a daughter in the uh, FBI. So she said, if they think they need you, uh, you can't get out of it. And she said, besides, I'm really, really tired of these quality, uh, <laughs> this quality retired time we're spending together. <laughs> so then I went, up for a, I went up for a second interview about 10 days later, and uh, Mr. Trump walked in, it wasn't really an interview, and said, I'd like you to take the hardest and what I consider to be the toughest job in the federal government. I panicked for a bit. I thought he was going to offer me the State Department. Uh, <laughs> all I could think about is, how do I get out of this? And he said, said Homeland Security. And, I, and I'd worked so closely with Jay Johnson, who was a good friend, uh, in my time in Southcom. I knew what uh, Homeland Security was about. I, collabor I, you know, I looked at our southwest border, at our country from the south looking north, which is a very, very different view of the border if you were standing in America looking south. And I brought that perspective to the job, and I think, uh, I think that's, uh, that's worked well for me. But that's how I ended up here. Very briefly, you've often mentioned that Jay Johnson is a good friend. Do you still talk to him? Do you consult with him? you ask him for advice? No, I, I will. But I think, in my mind, the best thing to do is to let some time uh, between the two of us drift apart. Just so, the most important thing for me is that there's thousands of really great career federal servants in, in the organization. So when I, when I have a question about why Jay made a decision or why the Obama administration may have decided to do something, I can go to them and say, because I, I would never want Jay or anyone in the previous administration to think that I was passing judgment or, or that I thought they were anything other than great you know, public servants. So I can ask people and say, why, why exactly did they do with this? Why was this decision made by Jay? And then they fill me in. I say, all right, that sounds reasonable to me. Or that's good information. I think we're going to, with, with new policies, we'll change that. So I would never want Jay to ever think that I was uh, questioning what he did while he was in the job. Well, speaking of policy, let's talk about airline security. Uh, after saying that it might be necessary to expand the ban on bringing portable electronic devices on board in carry-on bags, that you might need to expand it possibly to all incoming flights to the U.S. from overseas. You said at the end of June, airlines would not be subject to that ban if they stepped up their security uh, for flights into the U.S. So how did you arrive at what is obviously a compromise between the security you might have wanted and what the airlines said they would accept or, or, or the pu traveling yeah. public would accept? Uh, no compromise at all. <laughs> at all. Come on now. No. Uh, the, I'll start by saying the threat that we saw right after I took over, I was briefed on. And you, you have to understand, people should understand, that uh, there are people who work very hard, long and hard, to knock down an airplane in flight. Ideally, they'd like to knock down a U.S. airplane in flight on the way to the United States. That's, what, that's the Stanley Cup uh, World Series, if you will, of what they're... Uh, they, they've luckily gone in other directions over the years because of the respect that they have uh, for the TSA and the other things that we do at our, at our airports, uh, final points of departure. But anyways, very, very sophisticated. And this particular one, it was not only sophisticated, but it was real. And it was targeted uh, at certain airports. So uh, because we then, uh, TSA built a device, working with the intelligence community, working with the FBI, they built two devices, actually, tested them. And we didn't feel at the time that uh, European, not 
overseas airports had the kind of security initially that uh, could uh, give me a comfort that they could det detect this advice. By the way, and having been around explosions all my life, uh, the device, as it was described to me, had an amount of explosive on it that I just did not believe could, uh, could destroy an airplane in when flight. When you say device, you're talking about explosives on a laptop computer. Or, or other large type uh, electronic devices. So um, uh, we tested it on a real airplane, on the ground, pressurized, and to say the least, it destroyed the airplane. So anyways, we uh, put on the 21st of March, we put some uh, at 10 different airports. By the way, all of these airports as of about an hour ago are off the list. So what we did after, we, after I uh, put the, uh, the protocol in place that we would not have large devices in the passenger compartment and worked very closely with the airlines and air, airline advocacy groups, my counterparts overseas to include in the Middle East, explaining what was going on. Of course, I can't tell them too much about the intelligence, where it came from. Uh, but all of that added up to, you know, we could actually use this crisis as a way to raise globally uh, aviation security. So what we recently did was come out with a kind of a, uh, 60, 90, 120, two-year program and have said to all final points of departure airfields in the, in the world, if you want to fly directly to the United States with large uh, electronic components in the passenger compartment, you have to do these things. So in my view, globally, at least at those final points of departure airfields that come to the United States, globally we, have, we are raising aviation security as opposed to just going after one single threat. And you're confident these measures could detect these devices? I am, conf I am reasonably confident, uh, confident that, uh, that we can detect the devices given all of the things that we're requiring people to... Some, many of the things, by the way, you will never see. It's how we vet, how airlines, how countries vet the people that work, the insiders that work behind the counter, that load the airplanes, refuel the airplanes. You'll not see that. You'll probably, if you travel in the Middle East, not see canines, but there will be canines. You probably, it, what you will see is additional testing of electronic devices. What you will see is a greater number of people pulled aside for some secondary screening based on the country and based on uh, an individual profile. Uh, but most of it you will not see, but I believe uh, it raises aviation security uh, adequately. So how, you said it's not a compromise. How can it not be if the where you started was, we don't want laptops and carry-on bags? What, what it started was, we have a device that we don't think we can detect with, a, with a greater, enough accuracy to give me comfort in terms of allowing it to go in the, in the uh, passenger compartment. Um, that's where we were then, and the intel that told us where uh, the most threatened airfields, airports were. Uh, with this new pro these new protocols in place, that gives me sufficient confidence that we can detect it. You, you talk about, of course, detecting them with existing technology. So what is the Department of Homeland Security doing now to try to have a new generation of technology that can give you more confidence you can detect these things? The, the next, <clears throat> that's a great question, Pete. The next step in this is CT technology. We already... What does that mean? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a new kind of technology, no. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what CT stands for, but, but let me put it this way. When you, when you go through your airport check-in, your bag goes through, today it goes through x-rays. Your baggage checked goes through, for the most part, CT technology. We're going to take the CT technology and... Um, uh, in, in Here's John Pistol. What does CT stand for? Computer tomography. Computer tomography. Nerd. Thank you. <laughs> Former, former TSA director, by the way. Please, go ahead. Uh, you're, you're talking about research before we were so rudely interrupted. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, the next step is CT technology uh, at, at the point at which the passengers go through. Right now it's X-ray and some other technologies. Uh, so the technology generally already exists. We just uh, have to now start purchasing it. And airports will be required to purchase it uh, in the out years. And so how long it, before we'll have this widely? I mean, probably, probably between a year and two years. And by the way, Pete, we're not mandating uh, in a sense that airports, airfields, airlines have to do this. What we are saying is if you don't do it, you won't be able to fly to the United States uh, unless you put the, uh, unless you restrict the large electronic devices. 
Let me just ask you one other question about this. So the alternative is if you can't take it in carry-on, you can't take it in your carry-on bag or you know, walk into it with your hand, you have to put it in your checked bag. But if it's still on the plane and it has explosives in it, isn't that still a hazard? What, what have you accomplished? The, the, the threat would indicate at this point that um, there was no uh, possibility of remote detonation. But, but again, I can't emphasize enough there are people out there, very smart people, very sophisticated people, who do nothing but trying to figure out how to blow up an airplane in flight. So this is a, it's not gonna stop. You know, CT, CT technology is the next thing. Who knows after that? The other issue is, uh, I already talked about the insider threat, baggage and things like that. The other issue is cargo airplanes. You know, there's a fair amount of cargo, what we would consider to be just cargo flown on passenger airplanes, on a space right. available. Uh, they're constantly looking for ways to do this, and so people like, uh, John Brennan before uh, Mike Pompeo and, and me and others uh, are in a constant, uh, you know, battle uh, game, if you will, uh, to, uh, to stay at least two steps ahead of them, and we are. In your confirmation questionnaire for the Homeland Security Committee, you said this, the number one threat to the nation is that we do not have control of our borders. And you also said the highest priority would be to close the, that your highest priority would be to close the border to the illegal movement of people and things. Now that you've had some time at, in the job, do you still think that's the number one threat to the U.S. security? It is from, it is from my perspective. You know, uh, let me just start up by saying my initial conversation with you, Mr. Uh, Trump was he said we need to secure the borders. Couldn't agree more. He said, but we, we have to ensure that the movement of legal people in legal things, whether it's Canada, the maritime uh, borders, or, or the southwest border, that that is not only unimpeded, but is facilitated. So the, the challenge is, how do we get operational control of the border when you have you know, literally tens of thousands of people in a very, very, very uh, sophisticated network that has been operating now for a couple of decades at least that move people, things, anything up through uh, the Central American Dismiss into, uh, into the United States. So if you can't control what's coming in, and when I was in Southern Command, and again looking at the United States from a different perspective, I would say anything that can pay the fare, and the fare isn't that high, can get into the United States. In my sense, this is going back for six years, five years, four years ago, uh, or three or four years ago, that I believe if there wasn't a terrorist attack from outside the United States, um, once the forensics are done, uh, it will be seen that that individual or individuals came into the United States uh, with either a dirty bomb or whatever they brought, uh, came into the United States through this network. Now, people will push back, have pushed back, and said, well, the network is a transnational criminal organization network, true. The network... Uh, the people that run the network, and it's, it's very sophisticated, but fairly, uh, fairly um, um, decentralized as well. There's a lot of people involved in this. But if they were to uh, be responsible for terrorist, a serious terrorist attack against the United States, wouldn't that scare them, that the United States would respond to that and shut down the network? And the answer to that would be yes, but they don't check bags, they don't do explosive residue testing, they don't check papers, if you've got the money and say, I want to go to the United States, uh, they will ask you what part of the United States you want to go to. I mean, it's that sophisticated, that efficient. And what we're doing now is doing the best we can to stop the illegal movement of things and people into the United States. The movement of illegal aliens across the uh, border in the last six months or so, but certainly post-20 January, is down by 70%. 70%. Uh, and let me say up front, the people that want to come to our country, I understand why they want to come to our country. We have a better country than they have. And they're overwhelmingly decent people. But the fact is, we have a legal immigration system that allows 1.1 million people in every year uh, that are on the road to citizenship. Uh, we are trying to get our arms around and are getting our arms around illegal immigration, not legal immigration. So part of the answer to that is something that's been in the, in the eyes of the uh, community ever since the 9-11 Commission report, and that's an entry-exit system. How are we doing on the exit part? Well, we're um, doing very well, have done very well at, our, at the airports. You know, when a foreigner comes into the United States, they're entered into a biometric system. When that person leaves, if they're a foreigner, they're, they're entered into the biometric system again, and so we know who comes in and who goes out. What we have not done, and I think the law was passed 
12, 15 years ago, well, 9 it was part of 9-11, uh, we have not done well on the ports, uh, the land ports of entry, of which most of the, we have about 325,000 people come into the United States every day by air. We, we pretty much know who they are coming and going. It's the other million or so that come in and out of the country um, across the Canadian border and across the, uh, the Mexican border. So in my time here, I think we, well, we have certainly redoubled our efforts and we'll get, we'll, we'll move down the road to get an exit system at the, at the land borders as well. You think you'll have that in the, in the next three years? I don't know. You know, it seems like a fairly simple issue. You just take the biometric system, you're using it at the airports, and use it at the ports of entry. Uh, but the Except that everybody doesn't line up like that. No. But, well, uh, you're yeah, right. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the fact is that there's a heck of a lot more people. Obviously, this costs money. The, the, the great balance, the big balance on, on the borders, of course, is people don't want to be inconvenienced. Certainly, commercial uh, truck drivers don't want to be inconvenienced. Uh, but if you're going to stop and enter people into the, uh, into the system uh, and then check them every time they come in or go out, it's going to slow things down. That's why other technologies, facial recognition, that kind of thing, uh, I'm told that it's entirely possible in the not too distant future. Uh, and I've been down to the ports of entry along the southwest border a number of times, that you would be driving in, the cameras would look at your face, and unless the, the, the light turned red, you could just drive on in because the camera, the system would recognize you. It's not going to happen tomorrow or the next day, but that's the direction we're going in. But the biggest thing the president uh, and, and everyone along the border, north and south, uh, whether it's the local governors, the police chiefs, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the commercial people, is don't get in the way of legal things crossing the border uh, and, and legal people crossing the border. So we're going to work to that. The president's executive order that went into effect in, in March uh, gave you a number of homework assignments, including giving you 20 days to assess the reliability of visa background information from the six countries covered by the order. That period is done. What did you learn and what changes will be made as a result of it? Well, we, we went slow on that just because I did not want to get crosswise with the with the courts. Um, now, we had huge numbers of accusations that we were not uh, going, to, even though we were, not going according to what the court told us to do, so we went very slowly. But the end of it, as we, as we looked at the, the, the way people are interviewed, as an example, to, that want to come to the United States for whatever reason, legally, a visa, uh, the interview process, uh, the paperwork they uh, are showing, the proof of who they are and why they're coming, I would say is probably dated. So as we look at it now, the expectation will be that, you, uh, that the interviews will be longer and a lot more follow-up. As an example, the people that do these things, whether State Department or USCIS, DHS, uh, they're trained interviewers and can ferret out by certain lines of questioning what people really want to come to the United States. The example I would give you is, Someone wants to come, they've got a passport, which is not always the case today. They have a passport, and uh, long story short, they have really no reason to return to whatever country they're leaving from. Uh, the chances are they're, not gonna, they're coming to the United States and they will not go back. And that's, that's borne out over time by, uh, by kind of statistics. So if someone is, owns a business in pick a country, Iraq, uh, and their family's there, and they have a sister living in Dearborn, Michigan, and the guy wants, someone wants to come over for, you know, Ramadan, that, that person has ties to Iraq, financial, social, religious, whatever. So the expectation was that person's a safe bet because they'll go back. But if they've got nothing in the country they're leaving and they've got family in the United States, we want to look closer at them. And the other issue is passports and paperwork. You know, there's many, many countries uh, on, in, the, in the world that have really substandard passports. Uh, we need to uh, encourage them, we are going to encourage them, to upgrade their passports to what is today a world standard, chips and things like that, so that we can check the information uh, electronically in the passport against who they are, who they say they are. So this would be changes beyond just the six countries in the executive order? Uh, this would be worldwide. I mean, we have to raise uh, this uh, on a worldwide basis, and, and we'll do that. So it's no, not just the six. It's, uh, and there are many countries, oddly enough, I was looking at... Uh, at the list, and I'm not going to tell you what the list is, but I was looking at the list, and there's a fair number of countries out there that uh, surprise me that they don't have the top-of-the-line passports, as an example. Uh, it, some countries don't have passports uh, that, that 
you know, that anyone in this room, in this tent would recognize. So the attempt, just like with aviation security, has raised the bar for the world by saying you need to go in this direction, otherwise you're not going to come to the United States. So when would, when would we expect to see some regulations or some, this is similar to what you just did with uh, Yeah, we're, with going the through the, we're going through the rule process now, so uh, you know, certainly within the next six months, maybe three, uh, but we're going to watch, I mean, I've lost track of the court rulings. I have a large number of lawyers that live for court rulings. Uh, <laughs> I just, uh, we're, we're just being very, very careful. I do not want to get crosswise with the courts. But just to button this up here, what you're saying is there, you're soon will say, unless you come from a country that has um, a modern passport, you're not coming here. That's one, that's one thing we'll require, yes. Um, let me change the subject to uh, the election meddling. Um, there's some outside experts and state election officials who have said that they don't think that the administration has a coherent strategy to prevent another country like Russia from successfully meddling in the next election. So what's being done now to deter the Russians or another country from interrupting or destroying or somehow tampering with our state election systems? Well, Pete, I, I don't doubt your source, but all of the input I get from all of the states are, we don't want you involved in our election process. It's a state responsibility. I think there are 30, 40,000 municipalities in the United States. Within states, there's no one way that they, uh, that they run elections. What Jay Johnson did, and I agree with, is he established the election system uh, world, countrywide as critical infrastructure, and then, and then said, we can help if you want it. If you want it, ask us. You could design what help you might want. Do your own thing. Maybe we can come in and improve, but that's entirely up to you as a state. We're not going to take it over. Uh, if, if at the, in the next, I, I think they're nuts if they don't, because I think in the world we live in, cyber-wise, any second, third, fourth objective look at what you're doing would make sense. But if they don't want it, the help, uh, they don't have to ask. Well, I understand that. But is basically all you can do is say, I'm here with my hands behind my back. Call me if you need me. I'm like the Maytag repairman. Is there, is there nothing more you can do? Well, I mean, the other things we do federally is just watch these, these attacks, watch the activity uh, of these various actors, not only nation states, but, uh, you know, other, other actors who are, uh, you know, you have the nation states, of course, and then you have just criminals who are, who are working to make money off of malware and things like that. And then, of course, you just have, you know, what I would, what I would term vandals who, who just do this for kicks. Uh, we are good at that at DHS defensively. We're getting better at that. The name of the game is coordination within our government uh, at, at, every, at every level. And then, of course, uh, partnerships, which are, again, I had nothing to do with this. I just got here. Fantastic <laughs> partnerships with uh, the commercial tech industry, not only in our own country, but worldwide. And I have some very, very talented people that could make a hell of a lot more money on the outside, but they're dedicated public servants, and they are setting the standard for protecting everything in our country. Another dimension of the problem, of course, was the spread of false information using computer botnets and that kind of thing. Is that your problem? And if so, what are you going to do to try to prevent that? I think any, any injection of, uh, of uh, any cyber attack, and I would, I would, in my very layman way, look at that as a cyber attack, any cyber attack, uh, misinformation or, or malware or others, I think we have a responsibility. And we, do, we are very good at tracking that, doing the best we can, you know, once we see it, working with, working with the FBI, working with everybody uh, to try to track down, excuse me. Uh, so uh, is that something that now you're trying to develop a more robust capacity to deal with? Yes. You, want, you need to take that no, call? I'm, no, okay, I'm fine. <laughs> it might be the president, uh, <laughs> so I, I do want to miss the call. <laughs> It's nice being a civilian, isn't it? Um, <laughs> speaking of which, during your 45 years of military service, you were accustomed to a clear chain of command. Is, is it clear who's in charge of cyber? It seems like every part of the government has a little bit of it. And when everybody has part of it, it seems like nobody's in charge. So who's in charge of cyber? I, I, everyone has, uh, you're right, there's a, uh, there's a number of lanes in cyber, uh, NSA, FBI, DHS, um, the DOD, uh, there's a number of lanes. I think the, the way forward is to make sure that everyone's collaborating. Uh, there is talk of maybe making one organization 
in charge of it all. I'm not so, I, there is talk of that. I'm not so sure that's the way to go again. I'll what organization? Don't know yet. Yours? No. Uh, I would say that DHS uh, should be in charge of defensive cyber and then coordinate and be the coordinator of that within our government. Uh, but who's, who's so it's interesting to me that you said should be. I mean, we're not there yet. We, we still are not at the point where well, we know you, who's in charge. Yeah, I mean, no, we are in charge in terms of defense. Well, let me tell you, when, when we... Uh, for the government systems, yeah, right? For the government systems, the .gov systems. Well, I, I was very impressed a couple of months ago now, maybe a month ago, when, when, we, when we saw that first big, big attack, worldwide attack. Uh, I'm at the, uh, the White House, and uh, you had CIA on the screen. You had, well, in the room, you had... All the people you might imagine in the room are on the screen. And, uh, but the, the, the central kind of clearinghouse for the discussion was the DHS team. So you had FBI talking, CIA talking, NSA talking, and we're watching the worldwide map as this thing is, moves from uh, you know, kind of the medical facilities in UK through Europe and off into the uh, rest of the world. And what's astounding, should be astounding to everybody, is where that was a worldwide multi, multi, multi-million system uh, 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 attack, it barely got into the United States because of the effort, the defensive efforts, collective defensive efforts, I would say organized to a large degree uh, by uh, DHS. The, uh, you're going to take a trip here in another couple of days to Silicon Valley to talk with the CEOs and the leaders of Google and Facebook and so forth about whether they can do more to uh, prevent their, uh, their uh, social media uh, from being used as ISIS propaganda. Um, what do you want them to do? Well, I would start out by saying they already do a lot. The partnership is strong. Uh, they're responsible, responsive. Um, so I'm going to, there to first and foremost to say thanks, and, then to, and I'm going there with my counterpart from the United Kingdom, Amber Rudd, uh, and then to talk to them as a group about what we can together do more, because the, the, uh, the threat is morphing. And um, I was just out in, pardon me, Jordan, at the uh, Aqaba event that, uh, that, that the King of Jordan uh, holds on a regular basis. And he is a very, very close partner in the United States and a great, a great man, uh, unbelievably uh, um, distraught at what's happening uh, in the Muslim world relative to uh, radicalism. And he himself uh, is working very hard uh, and I can't wait to talk to him about the meeting that we have up in uh, Silicon Valley. He himself has got his people working hard. How do you not only, uh, in his world, how do you counter the radical threat? How do you counter what ISIS is saying to people in the Middle East? And, and, and by the way, Pete, this is not just about Muslim extremism. This is about uh, neo-Nazis, white supremacists. Uh, this is about any extremists uh, any, that could, that is, that are actively trying to recruit young people, get them radicalized, uh, but we're trying to stop this before those young people uh, take action that they will uh, be sorry for the rest of their life and, and create great uh, trauma to the country. Well, presumably you're not, I don't want, don't want to guess your answer, but presumably you're not going to ask the, the Silicon Valley CEOs to counter the message, right? You're asking them to try to prevent their social media from being used to spread it. Exactly right. And again, I can't emphasize enough, with us, uh, we have a great partnership with the, all of them. Uh, a couple smaller ones, not so much. Uh, and that would be another part of the message, too. The, you know, the, the, uh, the industry grows exponentially, as I understand it. So the, so the larger organizations that are working with us to maybe work with the smaller startups uh, to help them get to where we'd like them to be, and that is, again, to just simply identify uh, this type of thing that's on the Internet uh, or through their nets and help us... Uh, help us protect the nation. Well, do you get the sense, just the last question here, that they could be doing a lot more? I think they're doing a lot. You think they could be doing a lot more? <laughs> you can always do more. Okay. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, countering violent extremism, the DHS has awarded 26 grants, totaling $10 million over two years under the CVE, countering, viol uh, countering Violent Extremism Program. Most of the grants go to police organizations. Why isn't more of that money going to groups that want to be a bridge between the government and, for example, the Muslim community, or to Muslim organizations directly? First, in my view, um, when I first got to the job uh, six, seven months ago, I was briefed on this. And the, again, I'm a, I'm a slave to my past. 
I'm, I'm, my past is I'm, a, I'm an operator. And I said, okay, what's the metric of success? If we're going to give money to these organizations, what, how do we know if the money's worth the investment? How, many, how, do, how can we tell that X number of people, young people, did not get radicalized? Uh, or if they did get radicalized, how can we tell that we were able to de-radicalize them through these various programs? Uh, my belief, uh, and, and I also said to them, I think this, this is as much a, a, a local and a family and a mosque and a synagogue and a church problem as it is a federal problem. So let's look at uh, people who are already trying to get at this problem. You know, what cities, what states are investing their own money? What police departments have good ideas already and are putting their own efforts against it? Uh, and maybe look at what they're doing and reinforce what they're doing. I mean, this is an experiment. I don't even know if it's possible. I don't know if there are any metrics. Uh, so as we looked at that, we looked at uh, organizations that were putting their own money against it, had their own ideas, had been working this issue, and then we looked to reinforce that. Uh, and we're not just going again after, uh, you know, the, the organizations that uh, we're funding initially are looking at all types of extremism. Again, neo-Nazi, uh, anti-Jewish, all the rest of it, uh, white supremacists. Uh, so we'll see where it goes. Well, with respect, though, $10 million over two years doesn't sound like much of a commitment. You're right. So you, you, you want That's the amount of money that Congress gave me, so okay. that's what we'll work with. Okay. Well, how do you get to what works? How do you know what works? How do you find that out? That, that's, uh, you, you didn't listen to me just now. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we're trying to do. You know, in, in every single conversation I have with a counterpart overseas, every single one of them, I ask them, uh, is it possible? What is your program like? Uh, Europeans, Middle Eastern, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, what is your, I went to this Aqaba conference that, uh, uh, that President uh, Abdullah of, of, of Jordan had. Focused, I heard that part. Yeah, fo yeah. all right. <laughs> focused on Southeast Asia, focused on, uh, many of them were, were uh, from Islamic countries. And again, what do you do? How are you doing it? Can it be done? Uh, and within our legal justice, some of them it's, yeah, we just, we just tell the mosques what to, what to say. And so, and if they don't say it, then we arrest them. That's one end of the spectrum. <laughs> I would never argue for that, of course. But the other countries are struggling with this. Saudi Arabia has a, a, a program. Again, we couldn't do it. But they involve the families, particularly the women in the families, mothers, sisters in particular. Um, so whatever we can, but right now we're experimenting. Some of your predecessors, uh, especially Jay Johnson, made a point of going around and visiting the Muslim communities in the US. Do you intend to do that? Yeah, I was up in Dearborn, or very early on, went to Dearborn. Um, uh, Michigan, uh, and, uh, and uh, visited uh, a commu several communities there all in a the conference. They came to us. Uh, so I've done that. I've been to some things in, in Virginia. Uh, it's, it's, on the, it's on the pro, but yes, the answer is yes, I've done that. Uh, one of the things I would tell you is, uh, this may not seem like a big deal, but I spent three years of my life in Iraq, and I've gotten to know uh, thousands of good people who just happened to follow the Muslim faith. I have absolute respect for it. Uh, when, I left, uh, when I left after my last uh, tour, I was, I was honored by giving, uh, having been given an award by the, by the uh, Sunni endowment in al province, uh, protector of the mosques, protector of the faith. Uh, and we turned that war around in, in al province. We turned that war around by reaching out to the mosques and the imams. And those very brave men that we reached out to, because as soon as they were seen to be working with us, they were targeted by the extremists. Uh, but we, by working with families, but by working with the imams, I mean, I think I went to Friday afternoon prayers almost every uh, Friday I was there, just to show, at a different mosque, just to show, uh, show my respect for the religion, show my respect for the people. Uh, so I have great uh, admiration and great familiarity with the religion. Well, it sounds like you say then, from your experience in Iraq, that this can work, uh, but you seem skeptical that it can work in the U.S. Well, part of that engagement in Iraq was the imams telling us who the radicalized al-Qaeda types were. And you know, what we, did, you know what we did then. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, back to countering violent extremism. Um, and, and I'm not I, arguing we do that in the United States, by the way. <laughs> Uh, back to, to uh, countering the extremist message. Um, is, has, has the U.S. sort of given up on that? 
trying to, to publicly counter the message? It just not work? Well, I, certainly I haven't. Uh, I think most people are, are trying hard. You know, I, again, get back to the, to, to, the, uh, to the grants for a second. I mean, every single, uh, when I travel, I always, always, always meet with, if they'll meet with me, the mayors of the cities that I visit and the, and the law enforcement people. And I've spoken to uh, twice now to the, Amer the Association of Governors uh, and uh, several times now to these large associations of big city police chiefs or, or sheriffs and whatnot. And, and what they say about their outreach to every community uh, in their jurisdiction is, is pretty impressive. So no, I don't think so. And then of course, uh, it shouldn't be lost. It, when I was in uh, Saudi Arabia about a week, 10 days before President, uh, um, uh, President Trump visited Saudi Arabia. And uh, a few days before that, I was in, uh, in Jordan and they were excited over the fact that the president was making his first trip and specifically visiting Muslim countries first. Uh, and during his time there, they had uh, the Saudis, uh, as you know, collected uh, a large number of uh, leadership from around the region. Uh, so no, I don't think at all. I think Mr. Trump is uh, doing everything he can now to try to counter that. I know the, uh, you're eager to hear some questions from the folks here, and we'll do that in just a moment. But let me ask you two other quick questions. One is about real ID. This, again, is a 9-11 Commission recommendation. Is every state going to make it? I don't know. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, the, the commission said that every driver's license, every state driver's license had to be raised in terms of the quality of the license, the information. And in, and in particularly, what you don't see is the person that's holding the license is uh, actually the person whose name is on there. So it required uh, uh, a couple of pieces of documentation you bring it to your license bureau, which is always a fun uh, experience. You bring it to the license bureau, show them that I, you know, this is John Kelly, this is my birth certificate, this is my uh, discharge from the military, whatever they require, and then they give me a license. We don't, the federal government doesn't take that information. That's done by the states. Uh, the law was passed, what, 15 years ago? About 25, 30 states went right after it, so they're already there. Some other states uh, have, have, are working diligently to get there. And the deadline's been extended many times. Well, uh, I've been given the, uh, the authority to extend. I just extend. I think we have six states I just extended till October. Uh, as long as they're showing me good faith, they're working towards it. Because what happens is there's a drop dead date two years from now. And if you don't have a real ID driver's license, you're not going to get on the airplane. You're not going to go on a, a US, uh, you're not going to go into a federal building. Unless you unless have a form of ID, a passport. Unless you have a passport. So what we've done in those states, we have done in those states, first of all, working with the governors to say, you know, Governor, you really need to have a discussion with your citizens to say that, you know what, because of whatever reason, blame me if you want, but we're not gonna, you're not going to be able to have an, you won't have an ID when the time comes. Go get a passport. Uh, we have put um, uh, public service announcements up in the states that are questionable, I would say in the six months, six months ago, my people would have said there are probably 10 states won't make it. We turned up the, the pressure. I started talking spe purposely, specifically to governors. We sent people out to work with the governor's team to say this is, you know, this is what you need to do. So I think there's probably one or two states that won't make it, but we'll see. But the deadline is not the end of the year. Well, there is a deadline uh, coming up in uh, uh, January next for aviation. Uh, I think we're in pretty good shape with the exception of a couple of states, but the absolute, I cannot uh, use any discretion at all is 22. Uh, yes, you, I'm sorry, 20. One other question here. Uh, I've noticed that whenever you speak to a group, uh, when you testify before Congress, when you speak publicly somewhere, you begin by praising the workforce at the Homeland Security Department. Uh, and. We, we, don't, we don't often hear a lot of that from cabinet members. Does that just sort of come naturally to you from your years in the military, or did you think that that's something that needed to be done? Well, it's, it's called leadership. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know, for 45 years, I, was, I benefited from serving under men and women who are the most amazing people uh, in, in our society. Uh, the one percent, as we say, that serve the U.S. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the military, the five services. Um, when I came to this job, I was uh, really, really pleasantly surprised at all of the patriotism, 
all of the dedication, all of the focus on protecting the nation is not just in the U.S. military. The men and women, particularly those law enforcement organizations, Secret Service, uh, CVP, Customs and Border Protection, ICE, are incredibly dedicated people doing incredibly dangerous things, uh, and every one of them loves their job. So uh, it comes natural to me when someone criticizes those kind of people, whether in, whether in uh, military uniform or the uniforms of the DHS. Uh, it angers me, I'm offended by it, and I won't let it go by. All right, let's hear from you. Um... Uh, there's somebody here with a microphone, so you're standing right next to that gentleman. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, General Kelly, thank you so much for your service to the nation. Um, the ban on the six countries, um, every terrorist in the Western world, including in the U.S., Riverside, Florida, New York, Brussels, Paris, were either Saudis, Pakistanis, Emiratis, None came from these six countries. What are we doing about those countries that are actually our primary source of the terrorism in the Western world? That's a great, it's a great question. Let me, let, let me start by saying, and again, this, I was not part of the campaign. Uh, I joined the team, if you will, in late November, and that was the transition period. Uh, the, the EO that came out that, that, that identified the six nations were nations that had been already identified as questionable in terms of their paperwork and, and some of the things I've already mentioned, identified by the previous administration, by the Congress. Uh, so I think that was probably a start point, um, but you're exactly right. Uh, what we needed as we looked at that, and remember, uh, whether you believe it or not, I do, it was to be a pause so we, we could study all of the things that uh, people should be showing us in order to get to our country legally um, so that we could decide what we need, the, the so-called additional vetting, extreme vetting, and sit down and say, what do we need to do to, to uh, further ensure that the people that are coming here are at least uh, coming here, uh, are the people who are who they say they are and are coming here for the reason they state they're coming to the United States. Uh, so the pause, of course, we immediately in court and you know all of that goes back and forth. So as I, I explained just a little bit earlier, now we're in the process and we've taken a worldwide look at countries and said these are the countries that we're not satisfied, have the kind of documentation, have the kind of background checks, that kind of thing. And so going forward, country A, B, C, D, E, you need to start working really quickly at getting better in terms of your paperwork, your upgraded passports, whatever. Uh, otherwise, uh, your citizens won't be able to travel to the United States. But you're right. I mean, uh, the, 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 the databases we have, all of that, that that we do every day find people who are coming to the United States uh, for nefarious purposes, every day, uh, for various nefarious purposes, crime, uh, questionable in terms of uh, terrorism. Uh, but the databases are only as good as if the person's in them. Uh, and an awful lot of people, and we see this in, uh, in, the, in the European uh, attacks, uh, an awful lot of people are not in the system in a negative way. You know, the fellow that came down from Canada and stabbed, uh, uh, stabbed the, uh, the police officer in, I think, Michigan a couple of weeks ago, he survived, thankfully, uh, was not in the database. So when he came down from, from Canada, they, they checked the database, he's fine. So uh, the databases are great, all the rest of it is great. Uh, but we do really need to enhance this process. Jane Harmon, uh, Aspen trustee, uh, head of the Wilson Center, and recovering politician. <laughs> Secretary Kelly, thank you for your service. Uh, the largest unfulfilled recommendation of the 9-11 Commission was that Congress reorganize itself so that it could focus on the Homeland Security mission. Uh, that was uh, many, many years ago. Um, I'm really asking you specifically about an event that may happen this week, which is that the House Homeland Security Committee, on a bipartisan basis, uh, will probably vote to reauthorize your department for the first time since it was formed. Um, what does that bipartisanship and that effort uh, mean for your future? Yeah, for, first, I guess I would, I would say our government was designed by the founders to 
to be fairly slow, but this is really ridiculous when you think of it, 15 years. Um, if we don't get it this year, and it's, as you say, it's bipartisan on the House side, uh, I'll say my novenas in terms of the Senate side, but I truly believe that it's, it's, t it's time to do this. And one of the things I'm hoping for is, is that we can really start looking at the efficiencies within the department. I mean, there are 22 different parts of this department. All of them continue to be more or less uh, separate in their own stovepipes that all come to my desk. Jay Johnson uh, started a program before he left uh, Unity of Effort to try to streamline the department where we can uh, to uh, take advantage of what efficiencies we can we're going to put that on steroids. The number two, Elaine Duke, who's uh, my number two, wonderful woman, and has a lot of experience in DOD and in DHS, is that's the biggest rock and hurt that I've put in her pack. But if we don't get it authorized, I mean, it's the, the inefficiencies will continue. And I would just offer, you know, in my time as a, as a military person, I answered to four committees, uh, two on each side. And they were eight political committees. Uh, you got to know them. And there was never a question when you dealt with the committees. There was never, you know, we might say we need 10 aircraft carriers, and they might think we only need nine. That's fine. Uh, but they would work it out. The point is they work together. Uh, Mike Chertoff said today, where is he, that I, that I answered to 150,000 committees. Uh, I don't. But I do answer to 120 committees and subcommittees. I have, I have committees, I have parts of my organization that fall under two committees of jurisdiction, and the individual that heads that committee will go to one hearing and be told, don't you dare, and go to another committee and be told, you better. So we, we've, got to, we've got to authorize it. Uh, and all, you know, all kidding aside, uh, this is the time to do it. And I just really hope that the Senate takes this up and, and gives us a, uh, a way forward on this. This just happened on the guest worker visas, didn't you? You get all sorts of conflicting advice from Congress. You do. I mean, the, uh, the issue happens to be every, every year, um, mostly, mostly in the, uh, in the uh, uh, resort industries, there's a requirement for summer, summer help, um, and H-2B uh, visas, they're called. And there are agencies that are built up over the years that will actually contract, bring people in from all over the world. Conversation I had with one of the senators from uh, Alaska, this has to do with salmon and, and, and crab packing or something. But they actually bring large numbers of people from the Philippine Islands, transport them, house them, feed them as they work in the, in the factories there. And same thing up in where I'm from, New England. Uh, you know, the, the season starts in Memorial Day. It goes away in, in Labor Day during that period. The, the claim is, and this is, one, this is one part of the argument, the claim is that, that we can't get Americans to do these jobs anymore. And I mean, it always breaks my heart because actually they're the jobs my father did and my mother did, and their generation did. But anyway, and in, in my generation, those are the things we did as college kids to go up there to work in a Gunkwit or Kennebunk Port or whatever. Um, but apparently, we can't get Americans to do that anymore, so we have to bring them from Eastern Europe and Asia and places like that. Um, but that's one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is we can't get, uh, uh, no, you're taking jobs away from Americans. So I had the authority, the, the discretion given to me by the Congress uh, that I could raise the number to 66,000. They raised it to, they, they put 66,000 in, but they couldn't get any more. They gave me discretion to put 66,000. To go above that. To go an, an additional 66,000 discretion. Um, but they passed the bill in May. They should have passed the bill in September, but they passed the bill in May, and I then had to take input uh, working with the Labor Department because we had to certify that the jobs, if we raise the rate, the numbers, that we couldn't get American workers to do that. That takes time. There's also a process, once I made the decision, and the decision was, rather than go to 66,000, to raise it to simply 15,000. But the system that we have to work through, again, congressionally mandated, is one that takes roughly a month. So now we're at the point where we can start, those agencies can start to look for workers. But of course, there's only a, a, roughly a month left of the season. So the point I'm making is Congress dumped this on me. And, um, and as soon as the, the law passed, I was getting dozens of calls from both sides, uh, both sides of the hill, both sides of the aisle. And it was about 50-50. Don't you dare. Are you better? And of course, 
we had, uh, we had holes put on some of our nominees that had nothing to do with this topic. Uh, but at the end of the day, I decided to go under what uh, has been done in the past, rather than go 66, 15. But I've also told the Congress, I'm never gonna do it again. Either solve these problems yourself, or I'm not gonna exercise discretion. Yeah, the discretion I exercise in the future will probably not uh, make you happy. Question over here. Okay, there was a question over there, yes. Uh, right in the front row. If you could just wait, someone's scurrying to you right now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maggie Feldman Pilch. I'm from the American Security Project. Um, and Secretary Kelly, you've mentioned in the past that one part of your career that you enjoyed the most had to do with floating hospitals, particularly at Southcom. Um, and I wonder when you think back on that experience and, and what was so meaningful about that, um, how it makes you think about what we've referred to as illegal immigration, um, particularly in the case of Venezuela, maybe partnering with some people in countries we haven't partnered before. Um, I know we haven't really touched on this yet, and it's a bit different, but I wonder if you'd be willing to speak to it. Could you just uh, boil that down to a... Sure. Um, so I, I know when you were at Southcom, uh, a lot of time and energy went into providing uh, floating hospitals to various Central American countries. Um, and I wonder if you see a role for that in our immigration policy. Yeah, Mil uh, the job in South Carolina is very, very unique. Um, it was overwhelmingly non-military. There's almost no possibility, slight possibility of state on state. No one's going to, uh, state on state violence. No one's going to invade the United States from that part of the world. Uh, so most of what I did day to day was kind of drug and partnering with uh, various nations. One of the places that clearly needed all the help we could get it was uh, Central America. Uh, it's, uh, they're great people, great uh, countries, but they're suffering terribly. Uh, because of our drug addiction in the United States, because of our drug demand in the United States, recreational drugs, and I'm thinking here uh, methamphetamine, uh, heroin, and cocaine, all of which is produced south of our border, uh, and then trafficked into the United States. The, the profits that come out of that drug market are fantastic, and as a result, countries to our south, Mexico and further south, suffer terribly because of the violence of the trafficking and the production. So as Americans, we should be ashamed of ourselves that we have done almost nothing to get our arms around drug demand, and we point fingers at people to the south and tell them they, to, they need to do more about drug production and drug trafficking. But to your point, uh, to try to influence the lives of uh, folks who lived in places like Central America, we worked very, very hard uh, to inject investment, uh, certainly U.S. help. Um, uh, one of the things working collaboratively with the State Department and as a co-sponsor, the Mexicans came on board, we asked them to, we had a uh, conference on prosperity and then a second day conference on security in Miami about three weeks ago. We had a, I don't know, 12 or so countries come on board as uh, Canada, uh, Colombia, great country, uh, Peru, Chile, uh, Spain, EU, all came on board as observers. The idea is to try to help those countries out economically, but not by simply giving them the handout by, by investment. Uh, other things we did throughout the region, uh, the hospital ship as an example, that that we uh, get every, every other year. Uh, but much of what I did day to day, week to week, year to year down there had to do with social and economic development and always, always, always human rights. I never traveled to a country uh, that I did not meet with human rights groups uh, to discuss not only how their police are doing, how their military is doing, what the, what the impact of drug trafficking is on their nations, but also to find out how my folks are doing relative to their behavior in, in Southern Command or in, in that part of the world. That's all, uh, that's all the time we have. I want to thank our speakers, John Pistol, and also <laughs> Secretary Kelly. <laughs>